Mongols. And this is a Rus map. So... I think it's gonna be balanced. With that being said, welcome to game number one in between Kaposh and Mao Meika. It is uh, high view on the left side is Kaposh playing as the Rus in blue. And on the right side we will have uh, Mr. Mao Meika from Vietnam. One of the best Asian players playing as the Mongols in red. With me is the Mista. So we'll, I will ask him how the Mongols can actually break this fast castle meta of the Rus here on this map. I think the key is the wood line, the Rus wood line. If you can hit it with uh, a ram and archers, then you can uh, you can delay it a lot. And obviously, it must not be an all-in. It must be a pressure build, and then you can get castle yourself. I think that is the key. But it's really hard to push the wood line with the recent uh, ram nerfs. It is indeed very very difficult. There is also another added annoyance when it comes to using the mongols here and that is that it's much harder to kill the deer with your khan the khan needs more than two arrows to kill deer so you're almost uh forced to make at least one scout from your tc but preferably two from a stable so that you can kill the hunt of the opponent otherwise kaposh will have an insane amount of bounty yeah and i, I and i agree uh, stable opening should be your opening on this map against uh, the rus um, looks like we do have a pasture from Mel Maker. Now, that is not something that I expected. Um, he doesn't really have a lot of sheep near his town center. So, I'm not exactly sure what he's up to over here. But it's definitely a unique start out there for him. I think this is an improve because he didn't see the sheep. As soon as he placed his uh, town center, he moved his uh, can without spotting the sheep. So he thought that he's forced to do it. So I think this is like uh, something that happened because he didn't find the ship. Oh, that's just so, so disappointing for him. We talked about how good the Rus is in this matchup. Things like that are just not something that uh, Mel Maker can afford to let happen. You see, Kaposh is already in with like seven, eight sheep to work with. And on the other side, he is killing the deer. He's already at 165 bounty. So... Oh boy, that's that's a lot of bounty already for Kaposh. Yep, uh, this is gonna be really hard. Uh, it's a, like uh, Kapo got an amazing opening, and the only way for you to contest uh, the Gaia animals is if you can get your first scan with uh, on top of a scout, because I I don't know if you noticed, but the scout overdance damage. Yep. Looks like one wolf was taken out by the Khan over here. But you see, Kaposh is already at 235 uh, bounty, although it looks like the wolf deagros, so that's minus 25 gold for him. As we take a look at the huntable patches, there is one still intact down south. 235 bounty is not bad for Kaposh, and if he goes back to that wolf, he could easily get it up to um, 260, 280, especially with all that sheep close to his town center. Yeah, there's, there's 9 sip, that's 45 bounty, plus the 1 sip next to his wood line, that's already 50 bounty right there. If he's able to get the boars later in the game, he's guaranteed uh, 500 bounty. Yeah, exactly. Now, when it comes to the early bounty, what you really want to get to is that tier 2 bounty at the beginning, and that's something that Kaposh has already done. Everything above that is just uh, some extra juice on top. Exactly. And in this map, 500 bounty guarantees you uh, 850 gold per minute with the cabins, which is insane. Indeed. Speaking of the cabins, there is one for Kaposh that is generating 33 gold already. That's a very, very good hunting cabin, as it looks like Kaposh will get that other wolf as well. So it's 330 bounty already. Up to Feudal Age he is, and he will probably pop the professional scouts in a moment. Indeed, here it comes. Whereas on the other side, Malmaker is just now going up with the deer stones. He had to make a second pasture even. So I would call this a disaster start for a red player in here. Yeah, and I would agree with you. I would totally agree. Defensive tower coming up here for Kaposh on his wood line that will not only protect his base and the wood line, it will also boost the lumberjacking. And this is the main reason why this build is so, so powerful. It's almost impossible to push it early on because it's very compact. You don't even have to move out for gold. Just 
get her flute close to your TC, bring in a deer, and your wood line will be protected by a tower that also boosts your lumberjacking. So, if you think about it, it's basically comparable to an Imperial Officer of the Chinese boosting your lumber camp, but it also gives you safety. And in case you didn't know, you can actually transfer the aura. You, if you click on the tower, there's like a circle, and if you keep making lumber camps, it keeps moving the aura even further away. So you can connect lumber camps with lumber camps and increase the area that you're uh, getting the buff. Yeah, that will be pretty valuable because this is a big wood line, so at some point you're gonna have to replace that lumber camp. Kaposh already at 350, 60 food and uh, pretty decent gold already. Professional Scouts is uh, in for him, so I would expect him to start ferrying deer. And you see, he's starting off with the patch in the far right because he knows exactly that he has time to pick up his own patch of deer. Might as well go for the ones that are supposed to belong to his opponent. Yep, and he also has a lot of ship uh, found, so he's not in a hurry to get those hunts back into his base. Indeed. Looks like our red player is going to play Mangadai. Now, in general, the Mangadai is a great unit. Uh, it's also a Cav Archer style unit, but it can also shoot while moving, unlike the Rus Cav Archers. But it's very expensive compared to the Rus uh, Cav Archers. Even if you consider the fact that you can train them in batches of two, they do have a gold cost, and with such an exposed gold mine from Mel Micah, Sustaining production could be a problem. I agree with you. Plus, there is nothing that he can kill with those uh, mango dice. Uh, apart from the scouts themselves. Like, he can probably contest the scouts, getting the hands with the mango dice. But apart from that, there is nothing that he can really do. And the thing is that... If those Mangadai came out earlier, he may have denied the hunt, and then he can sort of slow this fast castle down, but if you look at the resources, we already see that it's too late. This is why this build is so brutal. You see, at 7 minutes, you already have the resources for Castle Age, and you're rushing that Abbey of the Trinity up with no less than 11 villagers, because you want to get to Castle Age as fast as possible, pop out the first one or two warrior monks, and start picking up relics. Yep, and then your economy just skyrockets. Exactly. Especially because you can bring in 4 or 5 relics without any kind of uh, danger, pretty much. Any other civilization has to walk out a defenseless monk or scholar or prelate. Your warrior monk can fight back, your warrior monk can run away. So, it's very, very easy to just pick up the relic and then run back towards your base. Yeah, there is literally no counter to warrior monks grabbing relics right now. And... There you can see that what the Mango Dies are doing, they're actually trying to snipe down all of the scouts carrying a deer carcass in the bottom uh, right uh, corner. Yeah, looks like uh, Kaposh will still get away with most of the deer from the far right. He's also slowly ferrying in his own deer patch on the left. So, while the Mango Dai do pick off the scouts, I feel like it's already a little too late for Mel Maika when it comes to killing them, because there is already Cav Archers on the way. Now, the good news for him is that he is not far away from Castle Age himself. He is very heavy on the pastures department, so you see he had to adjust to the fact that he didn't have a lot of sheep, but if Kaposh can't cut off that gold mine in the next two or so minutes, then Maomaika might actually get up to Castle Age and just continue with Castle Age Mangadai against the Cav Archer. In, like, in, uh, in good numbers, they can actually fight the horse archers, but the problem will be when the scouts arrive, because the scouts will be able to tank so much from the mango dice, and the horse archers that will be behind the the scouts will be, be will be able to take some clean shots on the mango dice and thin those numbers down. And we also have to consider, of course, that the horse archers don't cost gold, so they are probably considered much cheaper than the mango dice do. And of course, our Rus player in blue will have the relics going for him. There is already one warrior monk coming in with a relic, one will be sent to the north, so it's almost a guarantee that we'll see at least 3-4 relics for Kaposh here. Those and that gold that he will acquire from the relics will become food and wood to keep those horse archer numbers even higher. Indeed, with the golden gate he can just buy food or wood at a very very good rate, so he can just convert all that steady gold income into food and wood and just keep spamming horse archers. 
or get blacksmith upgrades like Boyar's Fortitude or the Steel Arrow line. You see he's already going for the defense and the attack upgrades. Maumaika is up to Castle H though with the Step Redoubt. So he's not going down that easy. And there's actually very, very nice Castle H time over here. Ten and a half minutes with so little sheep to start with is impressive. I would love to see Kapov take down the bars. Now that he has the map control and he's in the middle of the map, I would love to see him first taking down the bars to get that 500 bounty and then start doing what he's doing. Yeah, he's currently at 420 bounty. Nice, as uh, he already has uh, three relics garrisoned inside that uh, abbey that is looking concerning at minimum for Melmeika because he will simply start uh, getting overrun by better numbers. Deerstone's being pulled all the way to the front here to increase the movement speed, and we do have some Lancers joining the party. A very expensive army for Melmeika. Kaposh is on the way with two sacred sites already. That's the other reason why Rus can be so punishing in this matchup. The moment you start playing defensive, they can start taking sacred sites, although that warrior monk will not live to see another day. One of the problems is that even if you're not playing defensive and you're putting pressure, he can easily get the sites. As long as your army is not on top of the sites, he can just go there and take it. And that's exactly what he's doing. There is going to be one sacred site for him on the left side, one on the right side, and he even kills a wolf on the right, so he's at 470 bounty. So, even without the boars, he could potentially get there because he's got some more sheep to work with. Currently sitting on three relics. Um, looks like one Lancer will be dispatched to the left side to neutralize that sacred side, but as you said, Kaposh can always run away with the warrior monks and come back later to take them back. I would love to see Kapok get those two extra relics as well, just to deny them from the, his opponent and eventually get the monastery and put them inside as well. Absolutely. If Melmeika picks them up, it's just a 100 gold per minute advantage for Kaposh, whereas if he picks it up, it's going to be much greater. The Lancer on the left side does get cleaned up. But this is actually a pretty helpful piece of information for our red player, because now he knows that Kaposh's army is on the left, which is always difficult to find on a map that has so many stealth forests. And one thing with the cabins is that it basically gives you vision to pretty much everything. It's like if you are able, if you have the time to start making cabins on the right and on the left, eventually you will be able to see pretty much everything. And that's also something that the Mongol player can do. Just keep making some watch posts inside the forests and get sprinkled towers on them and that would do the, a, a similar job to the cabins. I love how the deer stones are pulled in front of the base of Melmeika because this is giving a speed boost to the villagers as well so he can react to any kind of aggression very fast and run away before he really loses numbers. As things stand if you look at the resource income per minute though that seems to be way better for Kaposh especially on the wood department. Currently uh, at... 46 villagers for Kaposh and 45 for Maumaika. So the only source of difference are the four relics for Kaposh. And uh, Maumaika also has the second upgrade for his food gathering. So he's he's gathering the, those sheep really, really fast. A tiny raid coming in from Kaposh on the right side. Does do some damage, but it doesn't kill any villagers out there as we do have the melee attack upgrade coming in from Maumaika. He already has the range defense upgrades and looks like he's going to play mostly with lancers here kaposh forcing his opponent out of his base as he's already going for the second sacred site i like how passively kaposh is playing over here not overextending just saying okay i have the warrior monks i'm just going to take the sacred sites i have the relics and i know that i will have the better economy in the long run because of that Yep, and he's also getting the upgrade for the extra HP uh, for his horses, which is a really expensive upgrade. And I think that is one of the reasons that he's not putting pressure, because he's waiting to get that juicy extra HP on all of his cow before now he actually engages. Now that's a disaster though. Speaking of the extra HP, he really needed that in that battle, but it's not in just yet. And that's a lot of that Cav Archers on the field with the speed boost of the Lancers. They could just jump on that group of Cav Archers, and suddenly half of the army for Kaposh vanishes. Yep, 
Yep, and that was a really good use of the Kana oh. ability. Oh, that's just so bad for Kaposh. Might have been a mismicro, might have been just bad pathfinding, but whatever happened, another group of Cav Archers gets surrounded. And those are losses that Kaposh can't afford. If you just look at those dead bodies, there's like one Lancer down, and I count at least eight dead horse archers. That's a massive win there for Melmeka. He's sitting at 24 kills and only three losses. Yeah, that was something that uh, Melmeka needed in order to stabilize the game, because Kaposh, it felt like he was ahead. But now it feels this is kinda even. It feels pretty even, especially because, of course, Kaposh has the extra gold income from the relics, but he can't afford to take fights like this one, because the heart and soul of a cavalry archer build is maintaining your numbers. Now, he's got no less than six archer ranges popping out cav archers that now do have the boyars for to upgrade as well, and he's getting defense upgrade in too, but behind this one, Malmaika is also able to mass some lancers, and it looks like he is moving up with the deer stones and the step redoubt as well. What is that step redoubt gonna do here? Oh. I think he's going for the gold mine, the big gold mine. Interesting. In the front. I would have thought there are safer options than that, but if you think about it, he's going to keep his army on the front line anyways. That might actually be the safest play to mine. Yep, and he has a really expensive army. Like, if uh, a couple. Uh, is forced to take an engagement. I think the Mongol player should come on top. And the thing is that now with the Deer Stones boost plus the movement speed arrow of the Khan, the Lancers can just keep chasing down those Cav Archers. This is a fairly resource efficient fight here for Kaposh and maybe an overextension from Melmeka, but he took a pretty good fight at the beginning. I think it's a slight overextension now though, because Kaposh has a lot of Cav Archers and the Lancers are going down. Yeah, and you don't want to lose those Lancers uh, this way. Yeah, that feels a little too excessive here. He took a great fight at the beginning, but then he was maybe a little too greedy trying to pursue those Cav Archers, because now his numbers have been decimated. And we talked about the fact that with the resource income that Kaposh has, especially the gold income, he can just get himself some more food and wood with the Golden Gate and just keep popping out Cav Archers. Six... Seven archer ranges worth of cav archer production. And Meomeka hasn't re uh, remade his ovo, so he has zero uh, zero income from on stone right now. Oh, that hurts as well. And of course, uh, if there is no ovo, there is no stone income, there is no double training. And you really want that double training to work out, otherwise the lancers or the mangadai individually are very expensive. If you had a... I... Oh yeah, go ahead. I love how all the all the early Mangudai that were made, they're still alive. And yeah. only Lancers are dying in the fight. That's actually a very, very good combination for Meomeka, because Lancers by themselves might not be satisfactory here, simply because uh, the Cav Archers will pick them off and run away. But when you have a couple of uh, Mangudai behind, they can just keep shooting and get some more damage done. A small raid coming in with Lancers, and that's going to get a couple of kills here at the back of Kaposhi's base. Like, the way Meomeka uh, is advancing in the map, like getting the middle, trying to hold the middle, it would be so sweet if he was able to place some uh, outposts with Springles in order to force uh, Kaboch to stay in, in inside. Because horse archers cannot kill buildings, so it would be easy to uh, go back and forth with his army in the range of Springle Towers. And also, the towers would give him the extra Yam Speed aura, as uh, Melmeka does see the Cav Archers running past, and he is coming in to pursue. He might actually surprise Kaposh here. Uh-oh, is Kaposh in trouble here? Because the only way to retreat is uh, towards the town center of Melmeka. This is, could be a great fight for a red player. I would love to see some scouts from Meomeka, just to tank the damage, just mix them in with the Lancers in order to tank the damage. And they're super cheap. And you see, those Mangadai, as you said, they're just so efficient. And while the Cav Archers of uh, our blue player has to stop, turn back and shoot, the Mangadai can just keep chasing and shooting all day, all night. 
and they don't even have the extra attack from the unique upgrade of the Mongols, I feel like Melmaika is taking over this fight. Yeah, if you look the key DA is it's three to one for Melmaika. It's brutal. Looks like Cav Archers will be forced to retreat, and as we go deeper and deeper into the game, that eco advantage provided by the relics gets smaller and smaller, because your opponent will also build up their own economy, so... The lead is shrinking here for Kaposha, I believe. Yes, I agree. I think that the longer the go game goes, with the current Kapo economy, because my Omega has a much better economy right now, even though Kapo has the relics, his food income is really, really low, and he will eventually not be able to sustain all those artsy reigns that he has. Indeed, we talked about the fact that as long as you do have the hunt being brought in, you do have the starting sheep, you don't have to add farms. But then there is a transition to make, and it's a big investment to transition into 20 plus farms that you need for the cav archers. Whereas for Melmeika, he has been building up his pasture numbers over the last 20 minutes, and now he's got a very, very steady source of food. Oh, and there's the outpost. Oh, I feel like that warrior monk is going to have a very bad day. <laughs> yes, she will. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. I think it might be his last day. <laughs> it is his last day, indeed. Uh, still no, no new Obu, though, from Melmeika, which is getting a little concerning. There is a stone mine right next to his ori original Obu, and there is one in the corner as well. That's a big one. And that's a problem, I believe, because many unique upgrades of the Mongols are locked behind that stone cost. So it's not only for the double training, many of these improved unique upgrades require stone as well. Yep, and Apo is doing the switch. He's going into Crossbowman. He's adding Crossbowman, and he has a really good number of them. Yeah, there's a pretty decent amount of crossbows. You still have some Mangadai out, and the Mangadai should be able to pick them off, but... It will require a lot more micro from Melmeika than what he had so far. So far it was just like, okay, send in Lancer, send in Mangadai, and pursue those Cav Archers. Now he has to individually focus down those uh, crossbows with the Mangadai. I would love to see Mangonels from Melmeika right now. If he made a forward Seeds Workshop, like slightly behind his uh, step red out, and made two Mangonels and sold them while putting pressure on the TC, I think that would be a game decider right there. The tower does get denied, and there comes the Lancer Horde. Crossbows will be able to take some shots, but they're already being pursued, and I feel like this might be tough enough for Kaposh. The moment he turns back to shoot, those Lancers will get some hits in, and so will the Mangadai. And now Kaposh can't really focus down the Mangadai with the Cav Archers. CA will clean up all those uh, crossbows, and the Lancers will focus down the Cav Archers. This is the perfect fight for Melmeika over here. Yep, 30 Lancers is not an easy easy unit to kill. If you get a good mass of them, they're pretty deadly. Kaposh is down to 32 villagers and 20 army, and look at that. Everyone on the farms are getting slaughtered. Malmeika hasn't even found the wood line on the north. You do have a lot of relics, but what are you going to do when you're at 23 army and Malmeika is at 48? Lancers are so good when you are putting pressure on a position that your opponent has to fight. They're so good. And as you said, the Mangadai are still alive, which is an impressive work from Maumaika, keeping them alive ever since uh, we had them created in Feudal Age. And Kaposh steps out. Maumaika pulls off a somewhat unlikely victory over here, I would say. Many have been saying that the Rus Fast Castle was very, very OP, and it started out to be a very rough game for Maumaika. Basically had no sheep, but then he nailed a pretty decent castle age timing, and from that point on, he just played... A very very patient game he didn't take fights that he didn't need to and there were times at this game where he had 24 kills to free that so the timing of the fights for him were always perfect I, I will agree with you like apart from the bad start and the lack of uh, rebuilding his ovo like everything else that he did made sense and they were very well executed Maumeika finishes the game with 204 kills, only 54 losses. That's a 4-1 to KD throughout an entire game. It's just massive. And you see that whenever we had fights, Kaposh lost more numbers proportionally. So he had the better resource income, but he just kept losing his Cav Archer numbers because the Lancers tanked a lot of damage and uh, the Mangadai 
kept shooting from behind. There were some of those fights where Kaposh's uh, units had a tough pathfinding, so many of those Cav archers got killed by Lancers, like eight or nine Cav archers went down and Malmakon lost one Lancer. So Malmaika always had the chance to slowly build up his numbers, whereas Kaposh kept losing them. And keeping alive those Mangudai, especially those Mangudai, it was so important because by the time the horse archers would kill one Lancer, the Mangudais would kill one, two, maybe even three uh, horse archers. Uh, 